delighted to present this exhibition of Stephen Pace. We have worked with Stephen Pace and Kathy Clayman, the director of the President of the Foundation, for over 10 years now. So we worked with Stephen when he was alive, and after he passed, his widow, and now Kathy. And we are grateful to work with such beautiful paintings. Stephen Pace started out as an abstract painter. He studied with Hans Hoffman, and many of you know that work. We've had two shows of that period of work. Um, here we've decided for spring on this beautiful day to present to you works from after 1962 when he sort of moved his style into a representational style. Um, and uh, we are thrilled today to have the expert on Stephen Pace, Martika Sawin, with us. Um, she was the head of the art history department for almost 30 years at Parsons School of Design and started the uh, program, the beloved program of Parsons in Paris, um, which many students that go to Parsons participate in. She's written over 100 articles and books on artists. Um, we have a connection because she uh, writes on some artists that are lesser known. There's an artist that I love from Maine called Alan Gussow, and he's a favorite of mine, and she really takes hard on writing on some artists that are well known and others that are lesser known. Um, just to show you, this is the Stephen Bay Pace book that she wrote. It's a beautiful monograph on the artist and the best thing that is written on him. Um, and so we are so pleased to have you today. One other thing I want to mention is beyond this show, it's up till April 20th, we are pleased the foundation has put together an exhibition of Stephen Pace that is going to show in Provincetown this summer, the Provincetown Art Museum. And so this gets Pace back to his roots where he studied with Hoffman. So please join us. It opens July 12th in Provincetown and runs through September. So that's a big thing for us. We're so pleased. Uh, so I welcome you, Martika. Thank you, Christine, and thank you for doing this wonderful show. It's such a pleasure to be here in the middle of these paintings, which for me is very nostalgic because uh, back in the 1950s, I uh, wrote uh, several reviews of Stephen Pace's exhibitions. And in those days, uh, in order to have the review come out when the show was on the wall, we would often go to the artist's studio or the warehouse where the works were and write the review so it would appear in publications at the time the show was up. And uh, I went to uh, a warehouse to look at Steve's uh, watercolors on paper. It was a show of his works on paper. I think it was going to be at the Howard Wise Gallery. He had a beautiful, uh, three exhibitions during the 50s. Um, and uh, so, anyway, I, I met him there in the warehouse just very briefly. And then uh, after that, he was, or maybe more, uh, he showed with Ellie Poindexter, wonderful uh, woman who had a gallery. First, she was partners with Charles Egan, who was a pioneer, very small, modest gallery who uh, first showed de Kooning and Gustin and Hans Klein and so on. And so then uh, Ellie went on, on her own and had her own gallery. And she began to show um, a, a mixture of both abstract expressionists and <coughs> Anyway, she had a garden party in the back of her brownstone in Murray Hill uh, for some of her artists and other, other people. And uh, uh, Steve and Pam Pace were there. And it, it just happened trivial story, but Pam and I were wearing identical dresses <laughs> and each other. It was quite an uh, unusual garment. <laughs> Those days we wore dresses to a garden party and we, went, we became fast friends. <laughs> and uh, so I kept up with the paces uh, more or less over the years. And then in later years we had uh, our love of Maine in, in common and we both spent as much time of the year as we could. Uh, the paces on, on Deer Isle, which is quite a ways away. But, so all of Steve's paintings that have to do with uh, Maine are, are subjects very, very familiar uh, to me. Um, I have to start in the very beginning. In, in 19, he came, after being in the Army, he came to, uh, he studied briefly on the GI Bill in Mexico in uh, around 1947. And uh, in 1948, he came back to the United States, and in New Orleans, he stopped, got off the bus in New Orleans, and he, he tossed a coin to see whether he was, he knew he didn't want to go back to the farm in India because they put him to work. Uh, he had had a very, uh, really hard upbringing on the farm. He and his 
three brothers worked terribly hard to clear this stubborn piece of land that they acquired for very little money in Indiana. And uh, one of my favorite uh, memories of Steve is when he said, uh, it wasn't until the four of us went in the service that Dad got a tractor. So, I mean, they were, they worked very hard. And I think that hard work is, is a very important part of his background. Uh, he was very frugal, he was very hardworking, uh, did not have a great many words, he uh, was frugal with words also. Uh, so, so, anyway, he flipped a coin to either go to San Francisco or New York, and uh, it came up heads and I took him to New York. And he got off a bus in New York, and he uh, uh, went around finding a a ten dollar a month place where he could live and work, and then uh, went, wandered into a bar, to, uh, talking to the man next to him, and that was Franz Klein, and uh, they became past friends. And through Klein, he uh, sort of moved into that 1948 uh, in, into that circle of uh, New York school artists, and became a, uh, a part of it for uh, the next ten years. Uh, he had been, he was in, in Europe when they had this Ninth Street show that was the beginning of uh, visibility of the New York School. So in all the subsequent years, he showed in the stable annual, and went always to the Artist Club, and was very much a, a part of all that. And I wanted, I'm sorry that we don't have any, um, I, I don't know if I can show you this. we will have to look at the what his abstract work looked like. It was very strong and powerful, and he was good friends with with uh, George McNeil, and, and uh, they, although their work was quite different, they both had the same very strong kind of out, outpouring, and uh, at Howard Wise arranged a traveling show of the two of them that went to various uh, museums around the country. Um, so that was Steve to, uh, to begin with. And uh, in 19, he, in the meantime, uh, met a very wonderful woman at a, an opening in a gallery, and uh, Pam, Pamelina, and uh, who came from Springfield, Massachusetts, from a very uh, simple, uh, humble background, uh, but who had incredible uh, style, and who and was de dedicated to Steve. And it really, I have to mention her because uh, she was the old-fashioned kind of artist, right? Who would do anything to uh, make her husband's career as an artist possible. And Pam worked for an advertising agency, McCann Harrison, and sports team uh, for decades, actually. And I was absolutely always uh, finding his side, going to openings, uh, making all, doing all the kind of social things that he did not uh, you know, particularly care to do. So I really have, and she appears in a lot of her, his paintings were, oh, point them out to you as we, as we go around. The, uh, uh, anyway, so in the early 60s, uh, something happened with that advertising agency, uh, Pan Eric's, I don't know, anyway, that she stopped, uh, I don't think she was still working there at that time, but they were offered a free place to live out in the country, uh, and sort of looking after this quite a wonderful stone house out in Pennsylvania, and uh, so they spent, they began going out there in the summers, and Steve would working uh, around the place and doing his kind of maintenance work and then outside doing his painting. And as he told me, uh, all of a sudden, you know, he was he was just putting paint on the canvas and then he looked and it was a robin. <laughs> and he said, I had to, I had to paint that robin. And uh, from that point on, and we'll see one of those very early paintings, uh, he, his work sort of gradually tilted towards uh, painting from life and figures came back uh, and landscape and, uh, and so on. And he went, uh, went on and Howard Wise, who had been showing mainly abstract art, uh, continued to show his work and people, uh, you know, no one complained that he had, <laughs> had, had changed. And I think, uh, and we'll move on just a minute, I just want to say one more thing, is that uh, right now I have, I'm, I'm working on trying Work, uh, a book about that period of time in the, in the 50s and the early 60s. Uh, artists, the, the uh, abstract <coughs> underpinnings for a number of artists who were doing, became figurative painters. 
but many of them out of Hoffman School or whatever, and they were in love with, with abstraction. And artists like Leland Bell, who worshipped Mondrian, and Nell Blaine, who said it all goes back to Mondrian, and so forth, who then became figurative painters. And I think it's something that's not really clearly understood when people come to write uh, art, art history and they, you know, it's figurative or it's abstract, and they don't understand that in that time, uh, people did not make such a big distinction uh, between the, the two, and then many artists were working back and forth between uh, the two ways of working. And a lot of the, of the, the, the ones who came figurative painting, the painters, their work was stronger because it had that abstract underpinning. And that's something that I think people just don't understand, reading off the surface of it. And it hasn't, it, it hasn't really been made uh, clear uh, in terms of um, art history. So, all right. Uh, this is one of the first paintings that, he, that he, when he began to do uh, figures. And you can see he's still uh, doing broad, uh, sweeping strokes and, 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 and very loose painting and, and very loose uh, kind of uh, way of dealing with a, uh, with a figure, with a, with a uh, uh, foreshortening and perspective and so forth. He had a, a classic uh, training uh, with an artist out in uh, was giving a WPA course in the 30s out in uh, uh, Indiana near Steve's home. So he had he had he was ready to study anatomy and he, especially he had to study the anatomy of courses, which was underlay these wonderful paintings of courses that he uh, did later on that uh, very loose as they are, uh, the, the, yeah, he knew he knew horses. Uh, he knew them from his own experience on the farm and uh, he knew them from seeing them on the running along the beach in Provincetown and running, you know, and working on the farm and so on. And some, I think, they're some of his best, uh, yeah, best, best works. Um, let's move on. Well, I mean, right, you've been looking at this for a long time, but it's, it's a good example of uh, what, what he moved into in the 70s. Uh, the way he handles the, uh, the brush and uh, uh, began to think a lot about, here it's, uh, it's more of a tangle, but you can think a lot about the, the impact of each stroke. Everything had to count for something. Uh, and, and so uh, he, he became quite interested in uh, uh, Japanese calligraphy and uh, uh, Oriental art of various kinds. So uh, here in this painting of reflections in the water, you know, every, every part of it is uh, clearly articulated. And he was very particular about how he uh, laid out his work, workspace and his work table. Uh, everything had to be wonderfully organized. All these little containers of the different colors of paint that he was going to use. Uh, I had, he developed a special way of stretching paper when he was working on paper so he didn't have to stop and fuss with everything. Brushes all carefully uh, clean and ready. So that when he picked a brush up and started to work, he didn't have to stop and fuss with things. He could just work, uh, you know, very, uh, very directly. And that began to be more, uh, more and more clear uh, in, in his work as time went on. So uh, let's move like on into the next book. Um, in the middle of this wall is one of his of the early uh, works that he did, working from life. It happens his white Pam holding a cat, and, uh, and this is also early on in, in that uh, time. This is from '62. Uh, a woman who's I think she's shelling peas, she's doing some domestic labor. This is one of the things that because of his uh, hard travel upbringing, he he really had a sense for laboring people doing tasks, doing something. Very you know, few of his people are just idle. And he knew the body language of people who did manual labor for a living, uh, especially we see that in his works of, of, of Lost Man. So anyway, moving from this, and uh, he moves into the, the looser uh, manipulation of the paint and, and the uh, brush. Uh, down the road, he eventually bought they were behind an old farmhouse in Stonington, Maine, which is on Deer Isle, right on the coast, a little coastal village where there actually had been a, a, a place where they, harvested, uh, they had granite uh, 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 works 
Uh, a lot of the credit for the New York Public Library and other buildings came from uh, this part of the main coast. So uh, I had a, a building, but it was mainly when Steve lived there, a fishing community, a lobster community. But down the road from the old farmhouse that you and Pam were able to, uh, to buy, which they loved and cherished and eventually deeded to the main college of art, um, was a lily pond. That was a freshwater lily pond. It was about a half a mile down the road. And he, they, he walked down there every morning. Uh, I think often, at, almost at uh, sunrise, early in the morning, so we could see the lilies open. Uh, they, uh, they closed up at night, and then there's a ton of rise, the lilies opened up. And uh, very often, on the edge of the lily pond, there would be a great blue heron uh, standing, which is the you know, most, most elegant of birds, uh, with this long neck and long legs like, and great flapping uh, wings. Uh, and it's quite a sight to see a blue heron skimming in to land on the edge of the water, where they stand, they'll stand immobile for hours. Uh, you, know, you know, waiting for a fish. Uh, so, Steve has had some wonderful paintings of that heron uh, standing by the lily pond. And then from his uh, porch, this, this old farmhouse, you can see the water, you can see the two islands that are there in that painting, uh, which stand out, uh, all the islands are covered with um, you know, uh, spruce uh, trees, so they're dark against the the sky and the water, and uh, this is his porch. And then uh, sometimes there would be uh, a boat, uh, a windjammer, a three-masted uh, schooner sailing, sailing by full sail. And so, uh, and this is the windjammer in the in the fog. Uh, so you see, it's, it's, you can tell it's like gliding along uh, water, which, which, which is reflecting uh, the fog. And as much as possible, he reduces it to, to the simplest means. He's not going to waste anything, uh, or do anything superfluous. So, and over here, this uh, wonderful uh, painting of the lobstermen that work on one of the wharfs. Uh, they are, the lobsters, when, the, uh, when they take the lobsters out of the uh, boats, when they've been caught, they put them in, in wooden crates, and here they are holding, uh, with rope handles, and so uh, they're holding the, the, the crates full of lobsters uh, to the shore. And uh, there are a couple of other um, lobstering paintings that you'll see where they're um, loading the bait. Which they pick up the bait on the wharf and then they put it into a, a big uh, bin in the, in the ship. And then they, that goes into the lobster traps, which go down to the bottom of the sea. Uh, and then the boat will come along with a, a winch and pick up a buoy, pick up the ropes, pull up the lobster traps, empty them, and take them. Sure. So he, he knew, he saw that going on all the time, uh, right, you know, uh, a few hundred yards from his house. So he know, just knew the motions of the, uh, that they would go through, and you had a really feeling of that, uh, you know, of, the, of the labor and what it was like, how, how heavy that crane might have been. And so the same thing with his clam diggers. I don't know, do we have any clam diggers here? I'm not sure. Uh, he had this piece of master of it, of the positions of the clam diggers with their short rakes out squatting down out on the, on the uh, flats at low tide. And there are a number of wonderful uh, uh, works uh, that show these clam diggers. And, and he, as I say, he had a lot of reverence for people who do hard labor. And, uh, well, maybe you'll look, maybe you'll look at this. Uh, at this book afterwards, uh, it, and also, I really recommend it. Oh, so I really recommend it for the quality of the reproductions. Uh, they are marvelous, and and the numbers of them. It's a whole, it's a whole biography of Steve in in, in pay, and you can buy it from Amazon for six dollars. So. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, maybe maybe you should move to me. In a way that is suitable to the what to what he's painting. Uh, these are the board, the posts that hold up the board here, uh, and and uh, so you have certain kind of stroke there. Up above, uh, seagulls coming. The seagulls come in a great flock when when the when the boats come in, and uh, wait, wait, look, some of the 
some of the lobsters are thrown back overboard because they're too small for the legal uh, catching um, measurement. And so uh, you'll have a certain kind of stroke, leaving often empty canvas, empty white canvas. Here it's mostly paint, but I think you find some areas of white that stand for the seagulls flying in to uh, scavenge whatever they can. Seagulls are, scavenge, are scavengers. They don't fish for themselves. They wait till somebody else drops. <laughs> so, uh, and, and that's the other side. I, I, and it's, it, this is a stretch of shore front where, and along the shore uh, are a lot of raspberries, well, uh, blueberries also, up here, raspberry bush. And, uh, and then we'll be against the, uh, uh, the dense uh, uh, spruce trees or uh, bayberry bushes or so forth. And so he has a different kind of stroke for each different kind of growth. And uh, uh, also, well, something he does very often, he'll, he'll thin the, put on a thin, thin down uh, wash of the paint. And then a, another stroke over it will be a darker hue, just, just enough to make a little vibration uh, in there. And then, I don't know, Kathy, maybe you have an answer to this. Uh, if he had a special brush for making those waves, uh, because it looks like it would be a, 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 four, or a four or five pronged uh, instrument that pulls across to make the wave. And you'll see that under it is a lighter, uh, um, it uses a lot of, of an oval stroke. And uh, the, the ovals are under there in a, in a thinner wash um, uh, paint. And the, um, the, the slightly darker shade, the gray, goes over, creating the effect really, of a, of a watery uh, surface. So the brush, like, as in a lot of oriental calligraphy, that brush stroke uh, is uh, very guided, um, geared to the subject and, and appropriate for uh, the subject. And I want to tell you, what I think about this relationship, uh, he really revered that wonderful uh, brush drawing, ink drawing of five apples, four, three, I'm sorry, three apples. He had a, a, a little, um, and reproduction of it hanging near his uh, his easel, and that to him was the essence of how you know what painting should uh, should be as, as minimal as possible and yet as as telling as possible. Uh, and he uh, there uh, once heard somebody who was teaching uh, Oriental calligraphy talk about how important it was for the for the teachers of calligraphy that there that you one go for a walk before starting to work, go out in the country and walk and clear your mind completely so that when you came back, the thing, only thing in your mind was what you were, uh, your brush stroke on the paper. And uh, I think that uh, Stephen, uh, in many ways, uh, you know, even metaphorically, uh, went for that walk because I think he tried to keep his mind absolutely free of other concerns and thank goodness for Pam, who made that possible. And uh, so that when he started to work, that, that, that was all that was in his mind. A vision, uh, unfortunately, we do not have here any examples of his recollections of the farm life. Uh, in his later years, he uh, went in his mind back to uh, his life on the farm. And their paintings of he and his brothers harvesting corn. When they, when, they, when they harvested the corn, there'd be a wagon, a team of horses, and they take, take, pick the corn and in one motion, shuck it and toss it into the wagon. And he, he captured those, you know, those gestures of, of uh, farm life. And uh, so that is a wonderful series in his work, which I'm sorry we don't have uh, examples of. So I think uh, I would love to know if you have some questions about all this. And uh, I hope you'll look at the other uh, other works, the earlier ones, and uh, I think I should say one more thing. What? Oh, oh, good. Okay. So, let's go with the clam digger. So, uh, if you have any questions, I'd be very glad to answer. Well, I'd like to know about his drawing. Did he do a lot of preliminary drawings? Tons, tons of drawing, but they weren't necessarily drawings for painting. Sometimes he would turn them into a painting. Oh, there were trunks in the drawings. And that wonderful didn't So painting didn't, wasn't preceded by lots of drawings yeah. and then he did that. Well, it would be many drawings of, uh, of that. I mean, like know that subject through drawing it, but it wouldn't be a potted out study for a painting. Okay. And, and likewise, this 
a lot, the paintings look like they're very direct one time. Like yes, exactly. He didn't wipe anything off and do it again. Well, I'll tell you, uh, he said, <laughs> once he said, you know, really, I'm a fake Zen painter. Uh, he, he would take tape. He didn't like this something. Like He'd take a piece of tape and he'd pull the paint off. Or he would sometimes put a, 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 another wash on or something. So although it looked like instant, uh, he would modify that if he felt it should be. Huh. And he called himself a fake Zen <laughs> But it looks, you know, it has the look of direct spontaneous work. Did he work plein air? Did he, he what? Did he work plein air? Did he work outside? Oh, well, he drew outside. He drew? Okay. Yeah. Uh, you'll see a number of paintings uh, and drawings of himself at work. He put himself in, in a number of works, and he, but it's always. Well, out, uh, outdoors on the porch, maybe, or something, be working. But uh, it's usually in his studio. And he sees himself, uh, and, he's, and he's, his easel's here, his window here, and he's sort of between the two. And outside, right outside the window, is the small vegetable garden that they had. And there is always Pam working in the vegetable garden. And it's you know, really nice, bringing her into the work, but very much in her own, uh, her own role, which was the, the gardener, the harvester, the housekeeper, and, and, the, and the model artist's wife. So it would be memory, or we would have a drawing of memory. Yeah, because it was just very clearly fixed in his mind. I don't think it was We're going to bring in the clam digger so we can look at, oh, sorry, right. 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 here maybe. This is one beautiful example that I couldn't fit in the show that I absolutely love, but this is what Martika was talking about with this beautiful sort of gesture of leaning over and in the ground, yeah, in the so sand, cool. digging. That's beautiful. Yeah, that's oh, yeah. This is beautiful. We don't have enough gallery space. <laughs> so many great paintings, you know. Oh, it's it is. Really. It's really and you can, you know, you also sense, sense the expanse of water behind and the areas that catch the uh, sunlight and reflections. And, it looks nice. With, I have a question about this. I'm going to say more minimal and reductive painting because as we've done a lot of shows of pace, Kathy Clayman and I have sort of fallen in love with some of these paintings, but the negative space becomes the most maybe important. This is called Gulls and Pier. Um, was this separate from everything else he was doing? Was this a particular period, or there were times that he was more minimal in what he was doing? The sailboat is that negative space, is really the positive. Of, was this something that he was doing all along in the 60s? I think it happened uh, you know, gradually, and it's much more evident in uh, works when you get into the 90s. Yeah. Uh, but you probably can find it in. Yeah, it's just these, these catch my attention now because every, we comment on the negative space and in the 60s there's less of that and then we, as we get later into the 90s about, it's about what's happening with the white negative space in this too. Wonderful. Anybody else? <laughs> <laughs> but the white is actually the canvas. No, those marks, yeah, it's a map. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the paint. How do you make those? And sometimes a razor blade. But I'm not sure, I can't say exactly. Yeah. 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 But he was very, you know, he, 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 he was very clear about what he was doing. And as I said, he wouldn't let other things impinge on it. He didn't talk politics or any, you know, uh, or art world gossip or anything. He, he, he just wanted to keep his mind clear for this. And, uh, I mean, well, he lived on 29th Street, and his uh, studio was over on 11th Avenue, uh, just above 22nd Street. Uh, it's disappeared. That building, he and, and, and Bill King's uh, son uh, had bought this building back in the 70s, and it was just an old tenement building. But as time went on, people kept coming knocking on the door, <laughs> wanting to, uh, to buy it, and Steve kept 
that that new studio on the top floor of that building. Uh, so he would walk all, every day from his home on 29th Street back down to the studio. And as time went on, and he got quite lame, and he walked very slowly, but he would just have his own pace of moving along. And, uh, and they were real old timers in the sense of people who grew up in the Depression, who came from humble families, and uh, who came to New York with very little money and found made a, a, a living here. <laughs> and I just want to say that we used to go either to the same concert series at the Metropolitan Museum on Saturday night when the Guarnieri Quartet played. Uh, they, they both loved music. And I remember one night, because I also lived downtown, and we came out, and it was, the temperature was about 15 degrees. And, and uh, I, I said to them, you know, couldn't we sh share a cab downtown? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> we stood out there for 20 minutes, you know, 15 degrees, so <laughs> waiting for the bus. And you have to take two buses. So. <laughs> so that is that was his background, and that's and I know many. Of, well, there are not many of them left anymore, but all New Yorkers like that who won't take public transit. I mean, won't take cabs if they can take public transportation. Anyway, that was sort of characteristic. So, uh, anyway, any questions? Well, did he have, uh, did he know Avery? The Peel School. Oh, yeah. Was it, was I'm sorry, I should have mentioned because yes. that was very important. When he was in Mexico uh, on the GI Bill at, at San Miguel Allende in about 1947, 48, uh, he was uh, painting and a, uh, a young woman or teenagers stopped and started talking with him, and it was Marge Avery, Milton Avery's daughter. And through her, he came to, uh, to know uh, Milton. And he, and he really, kind of in a way, I mean, his work is, is close to Avery, but it's not. I, and it's very, it's very different. Um, this may be the closest sense. one. Just okay. with the this one may be the closest to Avery. It's it's not close. You wouldn't have to do so. No. Um, yeah, anyway, they, they were always good friends, and, and, uh, and Pam became very good friends with Sally Avery, and, and, and Pam uh, said Sally Avery was the model for her of what an artist's way should be. Sally supported the family all those years doing commercial art, and, and uh, so anyhow, it's a, uh, it, was a, it was a real uh, important friendship for him. For him. But um, that Avery died much, you know, much, before, uh, much before Steve. So, any other, anything else? I, I have one other thing I have to say. I think that one of the reasons why, uh, for a long time, you didn't see that much of, of Steve's work, and it didn't get into uh, history books, because people say, you know, where does that fit in? They didn't realize what, you know, all the abstract background and so forth. And so the, the people, the, the critics of the time, uh, just saw him as a representational painter, old-fashioned or whatever, and it didn't make it didn't make any headlines, and they didn't stop to see what it was that he was doing that was his own thing, and uh, it didn't have a, a necessarily a pigeonhole to put it in. People always ask, you know, where does he fit in? <laughs> Not a fit or inner. <laughs> so, what was his breakthrough for showing? When did he start to show his work? Oh, he always showed. Right first when he came to New York. Where did he show? He showed at the Artists' Gallery uh, in the, uh, maybe 49, certainly certainly by, in the 50s. He had three shows, at least in the 50s. And then he showed with Howard Wise, who was showing the abstract art. But, but he also accepted when, he, when Steve changed. He showed there and then, and then with Ellie Poindexter. Uh, who was very uh, uh, accepting of uh, figurative art. She, she was the, she uh, right, right. showed a number of artists who, like, like De Niro and um, uh, <coughs> early uh, uh, Corn when he was doing his figurative work and so forth. So um, he had he, uh, he didn't have any trouble showing, although I, I don't think anybody really cared for his the last dealer but, that he so had. So when, when about did he go from? Being more abstract to being figurative. Do you know? Well, you know, the buying public lagged behind in some respects. And there, there were people who wanted work that, with the, that could recognize the subject. It wasn't, yeah. not everybody yeah. was rushing to uh, collect abstract expression. Mm -hmm. When he was abstract at first, you said he was in the top About 1962 90, yeah. or so. Yeah. yeah, but there's, you know, a little transition. But And in the 40s, he was painting in a figurative 
way, I think, before. Oh, so well, like awesome. student work? I mean, earlier, we, we have some examples from the 40s. I don't know that they're. Well, no, he was a uh, uh, Yeah. Uh, what he knew, uh, I didn't mean to mention, he was in the Army in Europe and uh, at first had station in, in England and then uh, went, uh, of course, not long after the Normandy landings. And uh, he was in a, a, a vehicle accident. And uh, in the army, and he was in the hospital in Paris, and he also he developed pleurisy and so forth. Got, so after he got out of the hospital, he was sort of recuperating in Paris, and uh, were painting along the river, and uh, this woman came along and started looking at what he was doing, and it was Gertrude Stein. And Gertrude Stein had stayed in Europe, uh, in a little small village in the, in the country during the war, and uh, she was very glad. Uh, to see all these American GIs and became very friendly with them. So she took hold of steam and said, come on, we'll go over and visit uh, Picasso's studio. So he went <laughs> and visited Picasso. And he had not, uh, up to that point, uh, he was doing uh, representational work. I don't think he had a conversion when he went to Picasso's studio, but, but just when he got back to New York, this is back to the United States and was started living, working in New York, this is what was happening. and, and um, and he went to Hoffman School, where you we were sort of you worked from the model, and you and and, then, and you worked abstractly both. Uh, so, anything else?